Welcome to the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability Podcast Series. Today, we are visiting with professor and author David George Haskell. Hi, David. Hello, Aaron. It's good to be with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. David is a British-born American biologist, author, and professor of biology at Sewanee, the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. In addition to scientific papers, he has written essays, poems, op-eds, and the book, The Forest Unseen, as well as his recent book, The Song of Trees, which we'll be talking about today. This book, The Song of Trees, has won the John Burroughs Medal for Distinguished Natural History Writing, as well as Public Radio International's Science Friday, uh, named one of the best science books of 2017. And Maria Popova included the book in Brain Picking's Favorite Science Books of 2017. And Forbes.com named the book one of the 10 best environment, climate science, and conservation books of 2017. And David, it's, it's so wonderful to have you here today and to know that so many in our communities and our global culture have responded to uh, this book so positively. Well, thank you. It's a delight to be here. And uh, I know that you have a uh, your undergrad degree in biology at uh, the University of Oxford, mm -hmm. and then you went on and did your graduate work at Cornell. Uh, what what were you doing your graduate work in? My graduate work was mostly on the evolution of of bird sounds. So birds, of course, structure their societies and communicate to one another mostly through acoustic means, some through feather displays and so on, but, but they're very acoustic creatures. And so I was interested in getting into that acoustic world and asking the birds, how come this sound is so different from this one? How, how do species diverge in their sonic displays? So that was my uh, initial foray, if you like, into the, to the sonic world of other species. And I've since, birds were the gateway drug, if you like, I've since moved into the sonic worlds of, of trees and soundscapes and uh, started in a, in, a, in a very scientific mode at Cornell doing, doing quantitative analyses of, of bird sounds and now has moved into a more open-ended mode uh, that includes sound recording and computers, but, but a lot of listening out uh, in unstructured ways in out, outside. You know, uh as we were planning over the last few days where we wanted to record this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, you suggested Boulder Creek right along this riparian corridor in downtown Boulder, Colorado, where we have plenty of cottonwoods and all kinds of other species as well. And uh, why, why did you pick this spot? What, what made you think of this spot? Well, this is an, an interesting confluence of, of of human life and plant life and non-human animal life. Whenever I come to this place, there are always interesting creatures. Just a you know, minute ago, a, uh, a kingfisher flew over. There's a little gathering of crows happening and of an American widgeon. And the trees here uh, provide part of the, the, the atmosphere of, of the place. These really old cottonwoods uh, that are integrated into animal and human environment. So and people are drawn to the park here. The library is here. The, the summer farmer's market is right here. So there's an interesting drawing together of, of pathways that happens at this point. And so it's, it's, a, it's a delightful place to be, but it's also a very interesting place to be because many different life paths converge in, in this one place, including the life paths of, of trees. You know, I'm struck that you have a a background and credentials in hard sciences in disciplines that generally are very technical and can be very reductionist yet when I'm reading your book the songs of trees I am struck by the the, the lyricism the poeticism in that you're using in your prose to describe this magnificent tapestry of interconnectivity that is mm -hmm. the reality here on this planet and I'm struck my gosh this is a scientist writing this and that isn't something I would have necessarily expected. Can you, can you how, did, how did that happen? Well, I think it's part of the structure of the world that, that uh, 
the world is made from molecules and energy transfers and those are arranged in incredibly complicated architectures that have great deep history. Now, the life on this planet has, is at least three and a half billion years old and that is poetry. Uh, that is art and so, so the world is isn't divided into separate categories the way academia is you know the division of science over here and then the division of humanities there and, and so forth no you know a river has its rhythms it has its music it has atoms it has living creatures it has dna within it environmental dna so all these different things that we divide into different disciplines and departments i think are all present together mm. Uh, and and you know, even saying that they're present together, I think, is a little bit of a falsehood because there is no separation. You know, the atoms are in the water, in the creek, are in fact mo the music. They are moving with a particular rhythmicity. Uh, and so the, there's, there is no separation. The, the, there's a blossoming coming from, from one place. And one of the great, the, the delights, the freedoms of, of writing in a more open-ended way in a non-fiction book rather than in a scientific paper is that some of those metaphors, analogies, rhythms can come to the surface of the writing and it's entirely appropriate that, that it would. Whereas in a scientific paper, which is also a really you know, wonderful place to be writing, but there's a, there's a particular form. You know, scientific papers are almost like the, the formal poetry <laughs> of science in that there is a structure for what needs to go in which part of the paper and you don't get to throw in wild speculations or interesting metaphors because that's not part of the agreed upon um, cultural rules for communication within that paper and I think that's great that, that, that you know those rules are there for very good reasons so the scientific approach and then a, a poetic approach I think are complementary they work together they're not in opposition to one another and that's one of the reasons to come out and stand on the, on the side of a creek is that that truth becomes abundantly evident, whereas sitting in a seminar room in a university or a high school or something, that those truths are hard to perceive. And that's the great challenge now in education, of course, is to uh, break out of the boxes that we have created uh, and embrace some of the, the actual connectivity of, of the world. And I think, you know, in some places we're doing a good job and in other ways, education is utterly failing in, in that task. It's so fascinating. So it strikes me as something we see in the, in the sciences as well as in the realm of business and economics that more and more of us are working diligently to resolve very challenging and complex mm -hmm. issues related to sustainability on this planet. And I'm struck that some of our tools, things like uh, financial models built in Excel, um, discussions and decision making in boardrooms, aren't necessarily uh, bringing in the type of natural intelligence mm -hmm. that is needed to uh, deal with these challenges in our time. And what I hear you saying is that there, there's something specific and uniquely precious in our connecting to places, wild places, like this, this one uh, mm -hmm. here that we're, we're standing next to. Yes, and I think th the key is that these, are, these different practices and ways of, of thinking about the world, of relating to the world, are, are not in opposition to one another. Mm -hmm. So modeling in an Excel spreadsheet or mapping forests using sophisticated you know, satellite technology. The, we, need, we need that way of approaching the world, but, but if that's all we have, then we're not drawing on the full set of, of intelligences, wisdoms, uh, community understandings that exist within the hum human community of life, but also exist within, say, the root system of this cottonwood, or in the relations of the invertebrate animals that live in, on the creek bed here. And, and an example that really brought that home to me in, in a way that I found very sad and disturbing was a, a few years ago I was part of a group of people that met in some corporate offices in New York City. We we're on about the 50th floor. In that meeting room was going to be decided the fate of tens of thousands of acres of forest in Tennessee, forest that was owned by a, a particular corporate entity. And there were some big uh, environmental groups 
there were lawyers there, uh, there were the, of course the people from the, the timber company, uh, all discussing and, and showing interesting data on the, on the, on, uh, the PowerPoint uh, screen and so forth about what's happening to the forest and what different people's perspectives were on trends and what the best thing for the forest was. The forest, I felt, was completely absent, almost completely absent there, mm -hmm. because most of the people in that room, and particularly the decision makers, had spent maybe one, perhaps two or three hours in the actual forest, mm -hmm. rather than those decisions being made by people who had a lifetime, maybe multiple lifetimes through conversation and, and ancestry, a relationship with the trees and the birds and the soil and the people, the loggers, the bird watchers, the people living downstream, the people living in the forest. All of these are different ways of understanding the, the forest and yet so much of that understanding just wasn't there. And so we were uh, using human power but doing it in a way that I thought was, was unrooted from some guides to good use of, of power in, in, in the world. And that, you know, that's just one example from my own trajectory. It happens again and again, and often these, these are very well-meaning gatherings uh, that have, in their structure, failed to open the door to sensory experience of the ecosystems that we're discussing. And if that door is closed, we're, we're, we're likely to make poor decisions, I think. This strikes me as, as such an important point for us to keep in mind as, as we're going forward. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful that you're writing about an experience of trees and forests and ecosystems mm -hmm. is, is so oriented around sound, around the audible experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck that the philosopher Kant, a couple, two, two or three centuries ago, when speaking about intellectual enlightenment, uh, used this term, unmundigkeit, this term of releasing from voicelessness mm. and I hear increasingly in conversations all around the planet that part of our challenge is that the rivers the forests don't have that voice in our in our boardrooms all too often and and it's as if they can't walk and show up in the boardroom to give them voice it's incumbent upon us to go to them and listen and boy if more mm -hmm. of us would go to them and listen, perhaps our decision making would improve. Right, so. right. Yeah, and that, you know, that listening, of course, happens at many levels. At one level, it's, it's literally just opening one's ears to the acoustic signals of the world. Uh, and the great thing about sound, of course, is that it travels around and through uh, and over barriers. So I might not see what is happening behind me or what is happening below the ground or inside the building here or just over the, the creek bank there, but I can hear it. And so sound is the great revealer. It's also, of course, the great revealer of environmental injustice, right? Who gets to listen to the traffic noise that you can't block out of your bedroom? Often it's, it's lower income communities and so forth. So sound itself is an important part of the communication, but then there's a listening that goes beyond that, that is about conversation and it's about gathering data. I mean, I would argue that those Excel spreadsheets and um, satellite imagery and so forth are another way of listening to the world. And it's not that we need to close the door to those ways and just go and sit by the creek and feel at one with the world, not at all. Right. We need uh, data come through the, the scientific process, but we also need our bodies to be in relationship with the places that, that, that are home to us. And without that bodily bodily connection, we're cutting ourselves off from from a lot of from a lot of intelligence and delight, because it's wonderful to be out here in the sunshine, listening to the ducks and the crows in the river, but also heartbreak, because you cannot open yourself to the particularities of any place on this world without realizing, oh, this land was stolen from other people. This land, the, the creek here, is is full of neonicotinoids and herbicides from upstream and the air that we're breathing uh, has got the the effluent of uh, factory farms blowing in from the east and so forth so there's a lot of uh, brokenness that has emerged through that listening but if, if we don't open ourselves to that how, how do we know what needs our healing what needs our, our attention
And so uh, the, the practice, and I think this is one of the things I learned in, in the book, listening to particular trees in different parts of the world, that simultaneously I it was filled with delight in these places, but also came to understand in a way that was very difficult to take in how broken the world is, uh, not just through human actions in relation to community life, but just life is built on a set of rather hard rules, is that every animal in the world will, will, will die often in a painful way. And so the weight of pain inherent in any place, just from the ecological rules of the world, is, is phenomenal. And that's you know, one of the reasons we retreat indoors and onto computer screens is, is to, to buffer ourselves from that, to push it away. But I think in, in a world that has so many crises, those comfortable buffers are things that we need to challenge in our own lives and, and try and break through a little bit. Which requires a certain courage, doesn't mm -hmm. it, to engage in that practice? Courage or at least persistence to say, uh -huh. well, we'll just keep with this, even if I'm not feeling particularly courageous about this, is that, no, I need to keep returning uh, to, to get beyond my preconceptions, to open to a particular place or other people and so on that seem, seem alien to me, but in fact are uh, part of my family. Yeah. There's a passage in the preface of the book, your book, The Songs of Trees, um, and I want to read it because it, it's so mm -hmm. beautifully echoes and encapsulates this interconnectedness, this relationship phenomenon that we're describing here. And I'm wondering, would you want to read it for us? I'd be happy to if God, you if you direct great. me it's, to it's the... It's your voice. And just this, this paragraph here, if you okay. don't mind, I, it's so beautiful. So this is a paragraph from the preface. Yes. And uh, the first part of the preface is setting up some of the rhythms and questions of, of the book about attending to the sounds of trees. And I write, in all these places, tree songs emerge from relationship. Although tree trunks seemingly stand as detached individuals, their lives subvert this atomistic view. We're all trees, humans, insects, birds, bacteria. We're all pluralities. Life is embodied network. These living networks are not places of omnibenevolent oneness. Instead, they are where the ecological and evolutionary tensions between cooperation and conflict are negotiated and resolved. These struggles often result not in the evolution of stronger, more disconnected selves, but in the dissolution of the self into relationship. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. Not, that's that's not. the uh, the message from the trees. <laughs> the tree is a living community, not a separate self. And that's the the great and attractive paradox of trees, that we use them as often as symbols of individuality. And yet, if you break the relationships among the hundreds of species that comprise a tree leaf or a tree root, that tree, its life ends. Oh, the paradox of it, that, that's so compelling. I would love to talk a little more about the sounds here. And in the book, you are um, visiting a number of different trees in a number mm -hmm. of different places all around the planet. Um, balsam fir, green ash, hazel, cottonwood, a Japanese white pine, and others. What's that experience that you're, you've been practicing in your own life and that you're sharing with others through this book? What is going on there when you're listening to trees? So, uh, maybe I should back up. So my first book was, was, a, was a meditation on one patch of old growth forest in Tennessee. I returned over and over again to that one place. So an act of ecological meditation opened my senses to the place. What I wanted to do in the second book was apply that same contemplative approach, but in places that I had, had chosen or had called out to me in some way as being really, really different from one another. So a tree on a street corner in Manhattan, right? There's a tree and there's like concrete and big buildings and so on. I mean, you're very, as urban as you can get in terms of a tree life. And then another tree is in uh, the Amazon rainforest. 
uh, in a place where there are tens of thousands of square kilometers of forest all around it. So you know, polar opposites in terms of the degree of urbanization and the, at least the superficial impression of the, whether humans were the dominant creature or not in each place. So very different and of course very interesting stories about ecology and people in each place. And yet under that there were, there's a unity though. And that unity is that the tree in Manhattan and the tree in the Amazon are both made out of interconnections. And people are critical parts of those interconnections now. Of course, in New York, a lot of people are unaware of how they're related to the tree on their street, even though that air is, excuse me, they're unaware of how they're connected to the tree on the street, even though the tree is connected to them through the air, by yeah. cleaning the air, it's, it changes the soundscape, it cools the street by 20 degrees in, in the summertime. So if you're a New Yorker, you, you are deeply connected to the trees of the city. And in fact, the city has done a, a, a good job of, of honoring that and of, of having a proactive strategy to keep uh, trees growing on city streets. Uh, some other cities haven't done quite as, as good a job of that. So there are all sorts of hidden connections in, in the cities. In the Amazon, though, which seems, you know, first arrive, see, well, this is a place where humans have no part. Well, people have been living in that forest for 9,000 years. The structure of the forest is partly determined by the presence of people there. And the, the lives of, of the people who live in the Amazon are very much connected in, in a very consciously aware way mm -hmm. to the lives of, of particular trees. And then, even though the Amazon appears to be a vast forest, uh, almost invulnerable to human influence, it's a place of rapid ecological transition because the, the forest is, the rainfall patterns are changing, the, the fire regimes are changing, and roads are being pushed in to extract oil from, uh, particularly from the western parts of the Amazon. So in both places, humans are right at the center of these, these networks of life that, that have trees within them. And so I, you know, I picked those two examples, Manhattan and, and the Amazon, as, as poles, if you like, and there are other ways in which trees in the book have grown in very different places. Olive trees in East Jerusalem, for example, a place where the olive has, has a, encouraged and allowed human life by providing food for thousands of years and is now at the center of, of conflicts over land. Whose land is this? And people planting olive trees as political acts and cutting other people's olive trees down and, and so forth. So the olive is at the center of, of both giving life to people, but also of, uh, it's at the center of the ways that people are fragmenting and pushing apart from, from one another. Uh, so in Jerusalem, uh, we see a very intense example of how relationships with trees both give life to people and are also at the center of our, of, of human conflicts. And that, that's not exclusive to the Middle East that's happened around the world again and again. I mean, now uh, a lot of human calories are being derived from uh, palm oil plantations in uh, Southeast Asia and, and the last remnants of, of many tropical ecosystems are being destroyed uh, for that. And so this life-giving but also destroying a duality is, is present in many different ways and, it, and in different parts of the world. And, so the book tries to use particular case studies to get into those questions. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible survey, not only of the forest ecosystems, but also of it's, it's almost an anthropological work in exploring the, the human relationships and interconnectivities with these systems. And uh, it's so fascinating. You've got this background in, in biology, yet you're really exploring the interdependencies mm -hmm. with the human realm and in a way that is not a not common to come across mm -hmm. in books mm -hmm. like this yeah you know i think it's a darwinian way huh. you know my training is is very is in evolution and ecology and i think one of the messages that we haven't quite fully heard from the darwinian revolution is that we belong here yeah. is that the the human body the hu human culture is another manifestation of life's diversity you know, right now it's a particularly loud manifestation of that. We're, we're, we're 
of course a very dominant force on on the face of the planet and and unique in some ways but in most ways just part of that great unfolding story of life so to, to study a particular tree uh, as a human is to realize how much I am part of that tree's story and my life is just as biological just as ecological as as the trees is and you know partly in this book I really tried to attend you know, really open my ear to those tree human connections uh, you know someone else might write the same book about trees and insects or trees and birds it would be those would be fascinating lenses to bring to this but but for this i really wanted to situate human culture and it's gr the great diversity of human culture and uncover some of those hidden connections to trees particularly in cities where i think you know, urban forests are so important to our well-being, yeah. and and some people get this. And, and luckily now, we're, there's a uh, we're in an era where urban forestry and tree management in in urban areas is understood more and more to be very important. And yet, it's still a little bit on the side in terms of uh, when we think about what are the key challenges facing urban areas or facing humanity now. You know, trees on streets often doesn't you know, make the top 10 list. And yet, I think the, the scientific data and the cultural data show that indeed in urban areas, an enormous part of the quality of life and even the presence of life is, is in relation, do we have other creatures, often other trees around us, to draw our imaginations into the living world, but also to give us life because without those sensory connections, we as, as humans start to wither. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, we have that sensory connection every time we eat, every time we breathe. Bringing that into consciousness, I think, is an important part of, of what we need to do. And you know, religious traditions have taught us this for millennia. Before you eat, give thanks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we may, may or may not situate ourselves in those religious traditions now. But the, but the lesson that transcends the particularity of any religion is if you forget where you came from, that your life is given to you through relationship. If we forget that, then, then we're, we're running away from the source of life and heading towards things that, disconnections that, that ultimately cause us not to thrive. Mm. It's so rich. There are so many strands we could, we could pick up and to pick up a couple. I am utterly struck having lived in my younger days in New York City for a spell by the incredible potential uh, for greater afforestation in our mm -hmm. urban environments and as our transportation modalities and systems evolve I think we'll probably find that human uh, bipedalism is actually one of the most important pieces of that framework mm -hmm. it affects our cognitive performance our immune systems and so on and I'm curious if we might not just see cities in the next several years become even more uh, replete with forest ecosystems, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if that's not mm -hmm. one of the keys to some of these complex challenges that we're facing. Uh, yes, I think it is. And I, you know, the, mentioning human bipedalism uh, is an echo of that. We, we're not brains in jars, we're embodied beings. And so, re-inhabiting something as simple as human motion. It, it shouldn't be a radical proposition that human motion is, is a necessary part of well-being. But, but in fact, you know, our, our work environments, our living environments are often structured around sitting on our butts as if we were brains in jars yeah. uh, and not encouraging human movement, not encouraging human interaction with other, other species. Um, yeah, so, so indeed this is an important part of, of urban planning. In urban areas, particularly older urban areas, there's a, there's a historical legacy that can be quite a constraint. So for example, in Brooklyn, a decision was made in the 19th century to have one big park, Prospect Park, and not to have lots of other smaller parks scattered around Brooklyn. So now if you live close to Prospect Park, you, you got lots of beautiful trees and open space, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to be, to connect with other beings, to see people enjoying themselves, people from all different walks of life. 
But if you don't live right close by, you have got a half hour, one hour trek to get there. And so if Brooklyn decides, uh, okay, we're gonna walk back from that. Well, the real estate costs for creating a new park in a neighborhood where those parks don't exist are very, very high. And so then, then you have to think creatively, well, let's create many parks along the street, along the sidewalks. So expand the open areas around the base of trees and sidewalks and create a place that's essentially a little mini prairie ecosystem that helps with stormwater drainage, but it also provides a place where people can connect to, to, up to the lives of other species. So, so the, there are enormous, enormous challenges. But there are some cracks and openings into, uh, into ways through those. The place where we have a real opportunity, of course, is in the sprawling suburbia. I mean, most of the land mass of North America and the whole world is not urban. It's like maybe 2%. An enormous amount of housing, and particularly here in Colorado, is sprawling out. And so as those, as those new cities, those new suburbs emerge, in what way will we invite other species in, in, into them? And, and of course, Colorado has some areas that have done uh, a pretty good job of that, and other areas where that that has not been part of the uh, part of the equation. There's work and to do there. There is, you know, and, and one of the challenges in uh, on the Front Range in particular is that because most of the Front Range was short grass prairie, yeah. the role of trees in urban areas, say Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, and so on, is, is difficult because uh, people want shade in their backyards. And, and that shade, in fact, helps reduce air conditioning costs. It provides pleasant places for people to hang out. It stores carbon. And yet those trees are not the native ecosystem, mostly. Uh, and so, so the Front Range has actually pretty low tree canopy coverage for urban areas. Denver is one of the lowest in, in the country. Uh, and, and we can see the benefits of, of planting more trees, and yet the ecological context is not, not quite so clear. Should we be bringing more exotic species in, in a way that most other cities wouldn't, wouldn't consider? I say New York is moving away from exotics and back into native species. Here, say, in, here in Boulder, the question is, as the ash trees are all being killed off, right. Do we plant just cottonwoods and ponderosa pines and you know maybe some some box elder those are the natives or do we expand the palette a little bit in a way that would be probably not so ecological desirable ecologically desirable elsewhere but maybe very appropriate here and so you know every region has its own challenges and and uh, that's another reason why we need to be out listening to the trees so the people making decisions about the urban forests of Boulder or Denver, Fort Collins, if, if those folks are not in relationship with the trees of, of, of their hometowns, then those decisions are going to be rather, uh, they will be imported from elsewhere and may not be well locally adapted. You know, I'm, I'm struck thinking about your comment about New York and, and Brooklyn mm -hmm. and thinking about some of the potential costs in uh, creating more forested pockets in some of our heavily urbanized mm -hmm. environments and I'm, I'm struck that while I was researching to write why on earth I came across some scientific literature indicating that for us humans literally just gazing at living trees and plants mm -hmm. for five minutes will uh, measurably reduce stress hormones and uh, coursing through our bloodstreams and so forth and that there's even research showing apparently that a pheromonal interaction with trees is affecting things like our immunity and potentially our, mm -hmm, our cognitive mm -hmm. performance. Of course, the, the great writer Thomas Berry suggests that as we lose our relationships with these trees and living landscapes, mm -hmm. we ultimately see our uh, intelligence and our creativity, our imaginations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. atrophy as well. So I'm just curious, you know, as a society, we are, we are, we are spending so much money on health and well-being, on mm -hmm. on stabilizing uh, levels of serotonin and so forth, mm -hmm. and getting out and walking to places, hopefully not too far away, mm -hmm. is actually uh, going to help with those same objectives and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not cost us the in the same ways. 
Indeed. I mean, so the, the more senses that one can involve in that process of connection, the, the deeper the, uh, the benefits for, for uh, the people who are, who are involved in that. So, so even you know, just gazing at green on the computer screen mm -hmm. has a certain level of benefit, seeing some pictures of trees and so on. And that's why you know, National Geographic's Instagram feed is so popular. It's like, hey, I get to connect with an amazing picture of a lion or this beautiful you know, p portrait of, of the Rocky Mountains. So you know, that's hitting a, a certain spot, in the, a very deep spot in the human brain, just visually. Mm -hmm. The acoustic element then adds more. So, so soundscapes, and but then the smell has this really. So the smell bypasses most of the processing senses, centers in the brain that the other senses, senses are filtered through, and goes right to a different part of the brain, that then pops into consciousness and into unconscious memory and the emotional components of memory, which is why the smell of you know, our parents' or grandparents' kitchen or, the, you know, the elementary school um, floor wax is such an evocative thing for us because it takes us right back through the decades. And the same then is true of connection with other species, the smells of Christmas trees for some people, or, or incense in a particular uh, situation in a, in a house of worship. All of those smells, now the, what we need to do then is to bring the smells of forest floor back to that mm -hmm. and of a healthy river and so forth so that those become part of our, our memory. Mm -hmm. The challenge in terms of health care and well-being is that there's money to be made in treating those illnesses and you can patent uh, pharmaceutical uh, interventions, whereas city planning doesn't roll into the uh, bottom line for Blue Cross Blue Shield or for drug companies and so on. Not that Blue Cross Blue Shield and drug companies aren't providing uh, helpful societal uh, uh, services, but given that the living earth is so central to our well-being, the question then is how in a, in a mostly for-profit healthcare model that we have now, how do we put things like planning for the health of people in 20, 30 years according to, by suburban development uh, rules and so forth. H how does that fa factor into health care costs? Uh, you know, that, so that's a question for economists that you know, we have a disconnected economy in terms of finance and, and money and we need to reconnect things. Yeah. That's so. beautiful, David. I want to um, just mention, thank you. I thank just you. want to mention before we um, get to the, the final section of our discussion that uh, to our audience, this is the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series. And we are today outside under the uh, beautiful sunshine and blue sky along the Boulder Creek here in Colorado, speaking with author and professor David George Haskell about trees, about our uh, interconnectivity with each other, with forests, with ecosystems generally. And his latest book, The Songs of Trees, uh, highly recommended, wonderful, beautiful read. You can get more information on that and on David's work generally at dghaskell.com, and that's H-A-S-K-E-L-L. -L. Uh, also, for any of you who are interested in the why on Earth audiobook and ebook resources, please use the code podcast at whyonearth.org to get discounts on those. We'd love for you to check those out as well. And uh, David, I, I deliberately saved a discussion of this region for the uh, final segment of our chat today uh, about this is your chapter on cottonwoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up not too far from here on along another riparian ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, maybe 30 or 40 miles from here very much like this one and cottonwoods were in the uh, the fields and the floodplains where we played growing up they are such an amazing part of the ecosystem around here and i was struck while reading your chapter on on the cottonwoods that there were a couple passages I thought I would <clears throat> share with our audience, and 
One is about a place in Denver where one riparian ecosystem called Cherry Creek flows into another called the Platte River. And it's this uh, place uh, known as Confluence Park now uh, for, for those of us familiar with Denver. And it, actually the way those two rivers come together, it forms a Y. And part of the fun for the Y on Earth community is we're looking for Ys all over uh, the place. Correct. So I, I thought uh, maybe if, if you don't mind reading this passage. Um, sure. And, and I wanted to reflect on something uh, toward the, the end of it, but mm -hmm. maybe this uh, underlined part. Sure. So here we're in, we're in, uh, in Denver in, in Confluence Park. Although Interstate 25 cuts through within 10 minutes walk, and some of the city's most busy streets demarcate the park to the north and south. The clamor of tire and piston largely overshoots the basin, opening a space at the center of the city for the pearl of water and the voices of children, cottonwoods, and birds. Here, the city is a low drone, spiked with sirens and motorbike pipes. The, the river cuts a middle way between these extremes of rhythm, loudness, and tone. The weir on the river is a bass roll with splashy grace notes, its steadiness unifying the tapered riffs of animal and plant voices. Thank you. So beautiful and, and so jazzy and, and poetic. And uh, I thought as a, a small mm -hmm. gesture of gratitude, David, for, for joining us in this discussion, I would uh, share with you and give you a poem I wrote as a young Thank man you. just after moving back from New York City to mm -hmm. this area and walking down into the, the cottonwood uh, uh, forest, if you'll call it that, along a riparian corridor mm -hmm. close to my childhood home. And if you don't mind, I'll read it. Just I to, would love that. Just Please. to uh, share this with you. It's called Cotton Wooded Buddhas. And right. as you were mentioning earlier in our spiritual and religious traditions, of course, trees figure in so many ways. We have the, the tree of life in the Kabbalistic tradition that makes us way into uh, Christianity and elsewhere. We have the Buddha achieving enlightenment under a tree, apparently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, incredible stories and metaphors. Well, this was my experience coming back to the Cottonwoods. Wonderful. And it says, uh, thoughts perched on fallen willow nothingness carried off by faint breeze of dusk towering around me are the silent still buddhas now gray solemn speaking steadily of nothing and i listen attentively flesh becoming fallen willow as spirit floats around in the neverness of now sun setting on today reeds click cladding in their patient koan dance fires blazing now in the last farewell embrace before nightfall the cloud fire slowly burns itself out again tangerine pink vessels sail on in ever darkening sea sky cotton wooded buddhas keep on singing their gold song swirling sinking into the night i wander back through the rushes taking my time in forever wonder so David, as a Wonderful. small gift, thank this you. is just uh, oh, one of thank you very my favorite much. poems. And, uh, let's That's beautiful. There's so many layers here. You know, walking back through the rushes of the, so the rush of life and the, the, the rush of sound from the... Wonderful. Thank you. A pleasure. And I was hoping we could spend the last few minutes talking about these cottonwoods. Mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. we're standing next to one right here. Uh, what's what's your relationship with cottonwoods and, and who are they who are these wonderful creatures <laughs> well we would need to sit here for a few decades to ponder what uh, who are they um, the cottonwood is is this creature that that uh, whose trunk is you know so solid often you know, in places in in the west there are, there are not many trees and you look out and there is a cottonwood standing as a signal of of stability it's, it's signaling where the where the water is and yet it's a bit of a trickster because it, it looks so ancient you know a tree that big in the east would be a venerable creature of hundreds of years old and yet a cottonwood that reaches a hundred is an old old cottonwood in the west so, so they grow to enormous sizes in just a few decades and then pass away and move on and so the 
if, if I give one answer to the question, who are they? I would say they're the dancers on Western rivers that are always in motion. So Western you know, rivers are, are forever changing their course and going into flood and back down. And the cottonwood is a champion at adapting to that. Of course, their, their seeds, the, the fluffy seeds blow all over in early summer. But for that seed to turn into the tree, it has to land on water that is on a, a, a descending flood. Right? And so the seed lands in some moist sand with no other competition around. If it, if it lands in the grass, it's done for. It can't outcompete the grass. It lands on moist sand, and then its taproot grows down and chases the descending flood over, over weeks. And if it doesn't keep up with the water, it's done for. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's something like one in a billion cottonwood seeds actually makes it to be a, to be a tree. And of course, that's why they produce so, so many seeds. And a little bit like the, the palm trees on the coast that are forever sending out seeds to colonize the next June after a hurricane, these rivers are a little bit like the dune systems of the coast, always shifting, always in motion, and the cottonwood leaps from one to another. Mm -hmm. So our human senses seem, you know, cottonwood seems so strong and old and, and permanent, and yet it, it's not. It's a dancer skipping around, taking some of that motion of water in, into, its, into its life. So that's, you know, th that's one reality that really comes out to me. But I, I'd say, though, that the cottonwood might have a very different answer about you know, mm -hmm. who the cottonwood is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the orioles that come here in May or the crows that are hanging out here in, in the winter would have their own answers for what is the cottonwood. Because mm -hmm. it's a tree that draws, of course, draws together so many different strands of, of animal life and other creatures around, it, around its being. So beautiful. So beautiful. You know, I'm wondering, our audience is a wonderful network of professionals, entrepreneurs, accountants, lawyers, educators, community leaders, mm -hmm. folks farming, folks preparing food, folks working in really any mm -hmm. uh, arena or sector of our, our human doingness here in our modern culture. And I'm just wondering, David, with your unique and, and particular perspective on all of this what if you could if you could give one piece of advice that would mm -hmm. apply to all of us humans what what might that be well it's not so much advice as an invitation and that is to pick a particular place and, and many people have these places so the invitation would be to, to deepen that relationship but to pick a place say for example a tree near where you live or a particular patch of, of grass on, on the, you know, the backside of a suburban development or some place where you can return again and again to open your senses to the stories of the place. And by opening the senses, I mean doing that sensory inventory. How, what is the quality of light today? And how is it different from yesterday? What am I hearing? And, and what do those, those sounds mean? So, and the key, it's, it's like a meditation, a repeated, giving of our senses to a place without any expectation of what we're going to find there. And those are, those are the practices that I think most of our jobs, most of our family lives don't really encourage. And so we need to make a, a personal commitment to say, this, this is an interesting experiment I want to try. Let me do this, even though my, it's not required for my job and it's, and it's gonna be challenging to fit it into the rhythm of my family life and so on. So the invitation is to pick a particular patch of this living earth and return it again and again with open senses and, and see where that experience leads, what stories, what insights it leads into. Wonderful. Thank you for that invitation, David, and thank you for thank you. joining us for this discussion Thank you. Today. It's been a great pleasure.